Welcome to the Business of Government Hour TV, a video companion to our flagship radio program. I'm Michael Keegan, your host. Each week, government executives and thought leaders join me for an informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government effectiveness. These individuals are truly changing the way government does business. This is a special edition of the Business of Government Hour, exploring the intersection of research and practice, enhancing medical device design with the ultimate goal of improving productivity and safety. My guest today is Monifa von Cook, Assistant Professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Maryland. My co-host from IBM is Rick Strasser. Take a look, take a listen, download the entire interview at iTunes at businessofgovernment.org. So, uh, Professor, would you describe or uh, give us a sense of what uh, your research area, your areas of interests are, and what is your background, and what prompted your interest in your research area? So, my background um, has kind of hopped around a bit through a variety of different interdisciplinary fields. So, I started out uh, wanting to be a doctor, specifically wanting to be a psychiatrist. I had this great interest in the human mind uh, and, and how humans function, which has been an interest of mine since childhood. Um, went into a program in biomedical engineering uh, in undergrad and very soon found out that I was performing better in the engineering side of things than in the science side of things. So the decision was kind of made for me that I'm going to go ahead and go on to graduate school in engineering as opposed to medicine. Um, But my interest in psychiatry and the human mind still continued. At that time, I didn't really know how to transition it with engineering, but then I found out about this field called human factors engineering, which basically studies how humans interact with technology and other systems and tries to optimize those systems for the human user. So that, that is kind of how the transition occurred. And still with my interest in medicine, that naturally went into human-centered design for medical devices. And, and, and so over time, I started to focus a bit more on what would be considered high-risk or vulnerable populations within the medical device user group. Um, and, and chronic disease patients, which um, some people who actually are chronic disease patients like diabetes and, mm-hmm. and high blood pressure patients, they know this, uh, approximately 90% of their care is based on them doing their care at home outside of the direct supervision of their provider. So these, this care is actually facilitated by devices, most of which are poorly designed. <laughs> so, so think about a glucometer mm-hmm. or, or what would be considered a, a blood sugar meter or, or a blood pressure monitor. These are actually um, considered to be highly uh, unusable by individuals who might be low-tech competent, Mm -hmm. which if we think of, you know, I could think of my grandmother trying to use a cell phone, Mm -hmm. essentially. (laughs) So, Professor, treating addiction and uh, mental illness is a major challenge for healthcare providers. I I was wondering um, if you could tell us more about your research in the area of virtual reality in behavioral therapy. How does it actually work, and how are you integrating VR into the advances in mobile health technologies. Mm -hmm. So similar to uh, what I was just discussing in the glucometers and the blood pressure monitors, those are mobile devices. Um, Many of them are not fully wired, uh, meaning that they're transmitting information, um, but a lot of trends are now happening in consumer and technologies across many industries to try to improve accessibility and mobility for the end user. Uh, who in this case might be the patient. Uh, Now, there's, of course, a lot of issues uh, that are present when you take care that traditionally happens inside of the context of a hospital or in a clinic or some physical healthcare location, and then the patient travels home. That that continuum of care is many times broken, uh, and that's when you have issues with non-adherence, remission in the case of mental health and substance abuse, Um, and many other negative factors. Um, So mobile health actually has a lot of great benefits for um, improving that continuum of care and sustaining that continuum of care. Um, So many of the advances that are now being made in the development of software apps have been 
and um, trying to improve communication uh, between the healthcare provider and the patient after they leave uh, the, the physical location um, of a hospital or, or a clinic. Uh, another way that mobile health is being used is to actually supplement um, the information that might be provided uh, by an individual who's providing them their care. So in the cases of mental health and substance abuse, there's a lot of apps that they're developing now to help with, for example, PTSD um, when um, patients may feel triggers. Um, the app may suggest helpful strategies. The, this is an example of a way that that continuum of care uh, is, is being addressed. Now, the way that, 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 um, that I am implementing it uh, is taking specific chronic diseases similar to diabetes and hypertension uh, and looking at how you might take traditional activities that happen in the healthcare setting and translate them to a software tool. So we thought about um, different mental health diseases where this might be particularly applicable um, as, a, as, as a baseline. Um, we, we're looking at tobacco cessation, um, which of course is something that many people struggle with. Uh, effective strategies to quit smoking, to sustain that behavior, uh, motivational strategies, etc. So um, one of the tools that is used it for behavioral interventions is group therapy. So typically patients may return to a clinical setting uh, periodically to, um, to talk with a therapist and maybe others who are going through the same challenges. So we thought about how can we take this uh, this activity and translate it into a mobile setting. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if you think about that, there's there's quite a lot of challenges there, right? You're you're talking with real people, um, and and something that uh, that happens when you talk with with live human people is that they have a um, a, a response. There there's kind of a feedback loop. So um, so so you provide some input. Uh, there's there's a response, maybe even a modification of what their plan response is um, in, based on what you say. Um, now, of course, if you're talking with uh, your cell phone or a computer, uh, that um, modification of response and adapting to your behavior, uh, that's quite challenging. Um, so we, we looked at how to actually implement that in, in virtual reality while taking avatars that, that might actually um, replicate um, to the best extent possible, uh, real human interaction. Um, so in addition to adapting to behavior, there's also the notion that, uh, that avatars are, are quite robotic uh, and, and that could potentially impact the behavioral uh, response of the patient who's looking to, to seek some comfort in, in interacting with the avatars. Um, so, so in implementing a group therapy simulation in in virtual reality, um, we use a variety of different motion capture techniques to uh, make the avatar's movements more realistic, more, more believable, less robotic. That includes um, facial movements, um, expressions. We took uh, smoker stories from the CDC website and actually took, um, took uh, motion capture of the faces of, of actual smokers and used that to design the facial expressions of the avatars while they were communicating the same stories uh, as, the, um, as, as those that were provided on, on the CDC uh, smoker experiences uh, forum. And, and that has, uh, ha has provided a bit more realism in terms of avatar movements. Um, now, in terms of the behavioral uh, integration and that feedback loop, uh, we're also using tools like EEG mm -hmm. um, and pupillometry to have a feedback loop of what the uh, user is experiencing to actually trigger different scripts that might be related to personas. Uh, that, that that individual is assigned to. Um, so we talked about these personas uh, previously in the context of the design of glucometers um, and, and the fact that there may be multiple personas in, instead of this one size fits all. So the same concept applies here. You can have um, multiple individuals who might be in this group therapy session, each may be representing a persona where that persona might be more, more uh, 
able to communicate information that would have an emotional response and trigger emotional stimuli uh, in, in the patient. How do you feel this, this research is transferable uh, to other industries or disciplines? Well, there's a lot of, um, go, going back to the discussion of, of glucometers and blood pressure monitors and, and um, delivering user-centered consumer products, um, particularly in, in the field of healthcare, there's a lot of uh, regulatory uh, mechanisms that are particularly pertinent to this. Uh, in 2009, the Food and Drug Administration made usability testing part of their approval process. So now medical device manufacturers who are going through the 510K process or the pre-market approval process, um, they apply with discretion this requirement to um, have their devices uh, tested um, in, in a what's called formative and summative usability testing. So um, initial testing and then um, some concluding testing to validate the device. Um, now, how this has an impact on what we're talking about is that we're saying that users are highly variable. Um, therefore, if you're going to approve a device, and, and part of that approval for um, commercialization and distribution is that you meet the needs of the human user, it would make sense that a representative population would be, including, would be included in the usability studies that are submitted to the Food and Drug Administration for approval of that device. Right, that 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 seems to make sense, right? If these are your users, include those individuals in your test, and if you can satisfy these requirements, saying that it is usable, uh, then you can get approval. Uh, the issue is that um, many of these high-risk users are not actually enrolling mm -hmm. in the studies that are um, that are being submitted for approval. In particular, the patients who are um, lower socioeconomic status, um, who in historically in clinical studies um, have 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 had issues with enrollment, representation in pharmaceutical based clinical studies, and and the list goes on and on. Um, that translates over to usability studies of of devices. So we have this this uh, this um, this issue of patients who are considered healthy healthy patients, quote unquote, actually being uh, participating in these studies. So patients who um, may not have significant um, mobility or eye diseases, patients who ha may have lower health literacy, higher tech competence, the lower risk patients who are actually becoming the majority in these studies. And the, the actual majority uh, of the population out there is the minority <laughs> in the nice. studies. And so um, that's problematic because that's how we get products out on the market that, um, that do not meet the needs of the end user. Uh, and I think that problem is, has been recognized and acknowledged. Um, we uh, had funding from the, the FDA to, to address this variability and to start developing uh, personas, empirically driven personas mm -hmm. that define how uh, chronic disease patients interact with technology. So, in uh, in a in an optimal world, uh, there would be a database that manufacturers can go to, and it would have a list of all of the subpopulations that are relevant to their particular product based on market consumer information that they've gathered on their existing suite of products. They then go to this database, and it would tell them what specific factors like health literacy or tech competence um, might be relevant for uh, the patient interacting with their product. And then it would tell them specifications for the product for each specific component that would help the manufacturer meet the needs of that population. Um, that is, uh, that, that would be great. That's, of course, quite a, a daunting task to develop such a repository. Um, but we sought out to take a small chunk of that, of that vision, um, that, that, that long-term vision that I have for, for developing this, um, this uh, comprehensive guidance for, for manufacturers and, and focus that on diabetes patients mm -hmm. and specifically on personal health records, which is a software tool that, that patients use to manage their health information, billing, appointments, 
um, and and some even provide uh, options to upload data from devices. And, uh, and, and so it's a problem that's being recognized, but it's also a problem that is being um, funded by federal agencies and their solutions that they're, um, they're, they're, they're soliciting to, to help to resolve this you issue. Know, you mentioned in, in the federal agencies, you mentioned FDA. Um, are there any, in terms of your research, as opposed to the regulatory, addressing regulatory issues and, and creating um, more effective uh, uh, more effective process. Is there any other government agency you're working with, like uh, within the health area itself, with some of the work that you're doing, VA or you know uh, anybody like that? Well, not specifically in the health industry. I do work with a lot of medical device manufacturers, okay. um, specifically those who are submitting their devices to the FDA for approval, going through the 510k process, mm-hmm. um, who have specific requirements to address. Uh, patient variability in their usability testing. That's um, that that's a bit of a complicated oh, co- complicated like task yeah. for uh, for a manufacturer to take on, um, particularly if they don't have the expertise in in house. Um, and so, so I do work with a lot of medical device manufacturers on that. Um, but on the the federal side, um, there's other agencies that I work with. Um, that are seeking to identify user variability for the design of products in a very similar way mm-hmm. as we've done here for um, for the mobile healthcare platforms. Um, for example, we have uh, funding from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, to identify um, looking at the design of control rooms, okay. um, specifically um, panels that the user might interact with um, and how human variability might impact human performance, specifically in responding to um, to signals, which in the case of a semi-autonomous system, you basically sit and watch a machine do, do its job, which um, sounds like that would be great in terms of not making mistakes, but, <laughs> but in fact, it's... Uh, it's quite complicated, in, in, uh, as we've seen in accidents like Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, which um, were both found to be due to human error as, as one of the um, issues that, uh, that, that propagated that risk through the system. Um, we also have funding from, from NAVAIR mm-hmm. um, to do similar work in control rooms, again, looking at how variability and operators might impact their performance, specifically looking at their human characteristics when they're interacting with control rooms uh, related to UAV control. Um, and, and so this issue, I think, um, the, the core, the, the fundamental issue is uh, humans, humans vary. How do you capture that variability? And then how do you use that to better design components um, and maybe even have those designs uh, adapt themselves uh, in real time to accommodate the needs of of the user. That's a nice way to put it. A, um, I like to switch gears a bit, mm-hmm. and that would go into uh, what are um, patient self management technologies, and how can these technologies empower patients to actively participate in their chronic disease management and care. So, so these include um, glucometers, um, blood pressure monitors, um, for example, asthma oh, yes. uh, inhalers, mm-hmm. um, anything that might be used to manage a condition outside of the direct supervision of a provider. Um, and as we know with chronic diseases, the primary uh, amount of care is done by the patient at home. Mm-hmm. And speaking of that, um, can you describe what you would consider patient-centric design and, and how that plays a role in those kinds of devices? So patient-centric design means that we, uh, we want to understand the characteristics of the, the patient that influence how they interact with the technology. We want to understand the environment that they're, that they're interacting with the technology within. Uh, and we want to understand any other factors that might influence their performance when they use the technology. Um, things like how they might interpret the information, how they might use that to then modify their behavior, how that, that uh, device might then um, facilitate communication between the healthcare provider and the patient. These are all included in this, this notion of patient-centered design. Um, the focus is on improving outcomes of the patient, uh, which in this case would be um, specific clinical markers 
that would show you how the patient is improving over time. Um, for example, with diabetes patients, typically they use hemoglobin A1C. They track that over time. So if a patient is getting uh, accurate information, is um, following recommendations on how often they should use their self-management tool, which in this case would be a glucometer, then the assumption is that um, they would be able to use that information effectively uh, to modify their, their diet and um, to have conversations with their provider maybe about updating their medication, uh, their prescriptions, and that this would then lead to improved outcomes and better quality of life. Now, of course, that's not always what happens. In, in fact, in most cases, that's not what happens. But uh, if the technology is designed in a way to, to best facilitate that, um, it can actually serve as a, uh, a, fis- a facilitator as opposed to something that hinders this process. You know, it's almost 20 years old now, and it's the publication by the Institute of Medicine to Air is Human. Um, the subject is medical errors. And I'd like you to define for us what that is in the healthcare context. And more importantly, how does your research seek to address, mitigate, or eliminate medical errors? Mm-hmm. So so I'll, I'll start out first by mentioning human errors, right? Because medical errors it, it came along... Um, many decades after people started using the term human error, um, which is a very controversial term because people assume that it implies that the human, um, the person who's at the end of the chain after a long series of actions, are at fault. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there's a notion of um, blame and train, meaning that whoever that individual is, if you're talking about technology interaction, it would be the operator. So if something bad happens, you take the operator and you, you blame them, which might lead to firing, um, or you train them, um, and that should solve the problem. The issue is that doesn't actually get to the root of the problem, and so you typically have these, these issues reoccurring. Um, and so these, these concepts of human error spawn from accidents like Three Mile Island, where we had a whole field, uh, a whole field of study arise out of this called human reliability analysis. Um, and so although the term carried a bit of stigma, um, it, it has uh, gone into other domains like healthcare where we see this, this IOM report uh, to Eris Human um, with this notion of medical error, which um, very similar to its, its predecessor terms uh, relate to uh, accidents or, or adverse events which are completely avoidable. Um, and, and in this case, the, the operator that I previously referred to would be, mm-hmm. let's say, a surgeon um, or a patient or, or someone who is at the end of a very long chain of actions. Uh, and, and so, again, the same issue arises. Do you, um, do you fire? <laughs> fire the surgeon? Um, do you just get the patient better training? Or do you really look at the core of the issue, which might be related to protocols um, or, or regulatory um, issues, or in the case of human device interaction, actually looking at the design of the product uh, and looking at how the issues related to interaction could have been mitigated much early uh, in the requirements of solicitation for, for, for user characteristics um, or in the design iterations and prototyping and testing that product. Um, so instead of blaming the user, uh, for making a mistake or misinterpreting information or forgetting to do something, you look at what procedures, what design process might have actually led to that. Um, and, and that's really the definition of finding the root cause. How can modeling human error be a useful approach to assess the safety risks in healthcare systems? So, um, as I mentioned, it's it's really complex to look at uh, a a large system where you might have lots of technology, lots of stakeholders, policies, procedures involved. Um, So when you look at human error um, and you're trying to approach it from this uh, philosophy of finding the root cause, uh, you want to have something to model that complexity. So specifically human error, you want to look at what are the um, performance shaping factors or the, the particular causal factors that might have led to um, that, that incident or incidents like that occurring. Um, you also want to classify how uh, the human 
might fail or how that behavior might manifest. Um, so if you think about um, different ways that that, that uh, events occur. Um, so as humans, um, sometimes we do things through automatic processing. So if you think about leaving your house and uh, did I forget to uh, to lock the door? Um, that's an automatic processing action. We do that so often that we don't even remember uh, actually performing the action, and, and we have to think about that versus something that has a much higher level of cognitive burden like decision-making, where we actually have to access rules and knowledge and problem-solve. Um, so if we understand how that error manifested, um, we actually would apply different risk mitigation strategies to something that involved automatic or subconscious processing versus something that evol involved more conscious problem solving. So uh, whereas a, a memory trigger might be appropriate for an automatic processing risk mitigation, um, you actually might have to dig a bit deeper into the decision making process. Uh, when you're trying to to access someone's rules mm -hmm. uh, that they're generating to actually come to some conclusion that they then use to act um, on information. I hope you enjoyed this special edition of the Business of Government Hour TV. Join me next time for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation. Until then, it's businessofgovernment.org.